Good morning, everybody. Let's see how quickly we can get everybody in from the waiting room. And we are almost there. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start as I usually do with our Zoom housekeeping stuff. We're glad that you guys are with us today. As we remind you each week, your Zoom toolbar is probably at the bottom of your screen and the chat bubble might be flashing. I just put a message into the chat. The Zoom toolbar is where you can find things like your start and stop video button, as well as your mute or unmute buttons. We do ask that everybody remain muted unless you need to unmute yourself to ask a question. It just cuts down on background noise and makes it easier for everybody to hear. The chat function is the best way to submit any questions or requests for clarification that you might have. So if you see the chat function and the message that I just put in there, that's the best way to submit your questions if you've got them while we're here together today. And as I reminded you in the message that I just put into the chat, if we don't get to your question today, or if you think of another question you'd like us to cover next week or in the future, please email them to info at condolaw.net by 4 p.m. on Tuesday evening, Tuesday afternoon. That gives us time to prep our answers to those questions for the following day's Q&A. If you want to be added to the, to the email list, most of you are already on it because you're here, but some of you might not be. And so if you want to be added to the email list for the reminders about this and other CLG events, you can also send an email to info at condolaw.net. And also our YouTube channel, which is linked in the chat, has uploaded videos from all of the Q&As that we've done, as well as like the recent class that we did on refreshing your budget ratification process. It was a budget ratification refresher. Those are all on our YouTube channel. And I did discover last week when I was messing around on YouTube that you can search the content of a YouTube channel if you go to our YouTube channel and not at the very top of the YouTube banner, but at just at the very top of the CLG channel, there's a little search icon, a little magnifying glass icon. And if you click on that, it will allow you to search the content of our videos. It doesn't search the actual videos themselves, just the descriptions. So you might have to play around with keywords because if you put in something like condo or assessment, you're gonna get tons of results. But if you put in more specific search terms like reserve studies or insurance or, or anything more specific than that, you might be able to narrow the results and look through a smaller number of videos to find what you're looking for. As we remind everybody every week, we are here to give general legal information, not legal advice. So if somebody sends you one of our videos or blog articles or whatever and says, well, CLG said this thing, so you have to do this or you can't do that, you can just ignore them. And keep in mind that you can only get legal advice from your association attorney because they are the attorney that, number one, has that attorney-client relationship with the association, but also that is familiar with your specific association, your documents, and the facts of what you're dealing with. So if you do need legal advice, make sure you consult with your association attorney. And keep in mind that if your questions that you're sending to us are very, very fact specific or require you to like copy and paste sections of your governing documents, you're probably asking for legal advice and, and we're unlikely to be able to answer the question. We try to do what we can to at least cover the general subject matter, <clears throat> excuse me, but just keep that in mind. And please also remember that the chat function during these Zooms is intended for questions or requests for clarification, not for discussion or commentary like you see on the CAI message boards. In particular, we hope that people will refrain from posting commentary of a legal nature, especially those who are not attorneys. But please also keep in mind that any commentary you see in the chat is not legal advice, even if it is posted by an attorney. So you can't rely on anything in the chat in that way. I also checked the Secretary of State website again yesterday night. The online nonprofit corporations filings are still unavailable and they are still very far behind. And I think the time frame that I heard most recently is about 50 days behind in processing corporate renewals and other documents that you send in by mail. So keep in mind if you've got your corporate status needs renewing or you have to update your board member list or whatever that it's going to take them a long time to update those. I did hear from the person in our office who processes renewals on behalf of our clients 
that they have stopped their normal process of updating associations to show as delinquent on the website until they get their backlog handled and they're back up to speed. <clears throat> so that's a good thing. Also, we do want to remind everybody, as we have been doing for a long time now, that we think it's appropriate for boards to review and consider their COVID protocols uh, in light of the changing seasons, weather, the different variants, the vaccine news that comes out, et cetera. We think it's a good idea to add the, this subject to your standing board meeting agenda, in part because it's a practical way to make sure you're addressing things as they change, and also because it provides good evidence if there were ever a future claim against the association that tried to argue the board wasn't taking COVID seriously. Finally, I want to remind everybody to vote. My ballot just came in the mail and I just opened it today. I haven't voted yet, but I looked and I live in Snohomish County. And aside from voting on a couple of federal issues, we are also electing our state secretary of state, our legislative uh, state senator, and a couple of state representatives. And this year in particular, our state legislators are going to be addressing issues that are relevant to community associations. One example is the middle housing issue that came up last legislative session. And this is a bill that is um, intended to make it easier for, for homeowners inside of or outside of community associations to build accessory dwelling units or otherwise increase the number of uh, homes basically and the ability for the number of occupants to go up within uh, different communities. The purpose behind the bill is intended to create more affordable housing opportunities and increase the density of housing. But this is something that will affect community associations uniquely and again, it's going to be coming up this legislative session. So please, please, please vote. And if you want some information from the, the WSCAI Legislative Action Committee about the issues that are coming up, and um, if you want to ask the LAC about whether there's an opinion on how you should vote, uh, we can certainly try to put you in touch with someone from the LAC to see if there's that kind of feedback available. So. That is all of our sort of normal weekly content and reminders, and we're going to jump into the substance here unless you have anything you want to add before we keep going, Ken. No, I'm good. All right, here's our first question. Do special assessments being voted on on a budget meeting fall under Wakaiowa laws? Is it passed vote? Sorry, is it passed by a vote with just those that are present? So there's a typo in the question. So. The short answer is that special assessments are ratified in exactly the same manner that you would ratify your regular annual budget. So yes, you special assessments are ratified and have to be adopted or ratified consistent with the process that's detailed in Wakaiowa. And the section of the statute that's relevant is RCW 6490-525. And if you follow the process that's detailed there, unless at the budget ratification meeting, more than 50% of the voting power in the community, not just those that are present, but in the community as a whole, vote to reject the budget, then it's ratified. So what Wakaiowa does is it essentially switches the default. The default is that your budget's gonna be ratified, provided that you follow the process correctly, unless enough owners vote against it. Previous to Wakaiowa, most of the budget ratification processes that were detailed in governing documents and in the statutes that required it required an affirmative vote to pass or ratify the budget. Now the default is that it will be ratified unless it's rejected. If you would like a more detailed description of the process, you can listen to our budget ratification refresher, which is on our YouTube channel. Again, that link was put into the chat at the beginning of the Q&A today. If you go back three weeks, I think, is when we did the budget ratification refresher, and that goes through the entire process. So to be really clear, yes, that applies to special assessments. And the ratification vote, it requires a percentage of the total voting power in the community to reject the budget, not just a percentage of those present at the meeting. Ken, did you want to add anything before I keep moving? No, I'm good. I feel like we've covered this one many times. Yes. Okay, next question. 
Could you please go over the hierarchy of governing documents and the type of material that's appropriate to include in each one? So I'm gonna start by saying that we have covered this in previous Q and A's as well as uh, on our blog. So if you go to condolaw.net and go to the blog and just search for the term hierarchy, you're gonna stumble on at least one, if not more than one blog articles. And if you use the same term, when you go to our YouTube channel and search just in the channel, you'll see a couple of videos on this as well. I wanna start by saying that the statutes are sort of like the highest level of authority. There are some federal statutes that pertain to community associations, but most of the time when we talk about the statutes that what we are dealing with are the state statutes like the HOA Act, uh, the old Condo Act, the new Condo Act, and then Wakiowa. And those govern communities that were created certain types of communities that were created in certain time frames. So if you're a single family home HOA, like a Platt community, and you were formed before July 1st, 2018, you are probably governed by the HOA Act. If you're a condo and you were formed before July 1st, 1990, you're governed by the old Act, which is called the Horizontal Property Regimes Act. If you're a condo that was formed from July 1st, 1990 through the end of June of 2018, then you're governed by the new Condo Act. And if you're a condo that was created since then, since July 1st, 2018, then you're governed by Wakiowa. Long-term, the intent is that there will be one statute, Wakiowa or something like it, that governs all community associations that are created. And certainly from July 1st, 2018 forward, that is true. There are other statutes, state statutes that affect community associations, including things like the nonprofit corporations statute that your community is formed under. When it comes to the governing documents, each community has a set of recorded covenants. Uh, they're called covenants, conditions, restrictions, and reservations, which is CCNRs, commonly also referred to as the declaration. This is the document that should contain all of the deed restrictions and it provides for the association's authority to charge assessments to the owners, authority to enforce the governing documents, etc. So this is sort of the document that's, re that's recorded, it, it's referred to and kind of folded into your deed when you purchase your property and contains information about the rights and restrictions for owners and for the association within that community generally also recorded at the same time as the declaration is the survey map and plans. Often this document is not really mentioned when we talk about governing documents because there's not necessarily the same type of governance information in it, like paragraphs of you know information and restrictions and whatnot. But sometimes the maps can be really important when you're trying to determine things that are also covered in the declaration including things like boundaries between lots or units and common areas like decks or parking spaces, things like that. Um, bylaws are usually, but not always unrecorded and they should deal mostly with procedural or governance related issues. So one of the things that I think Ken has said in the past, which is a helpful way of sort of telling the difference between the declaration and the bylaws is that the declaration tends to govern the land the property, whereas the bylaws makes rules for the people, for the how you guys operate together as a community, things like how you conduct your meetings, what are your quorum requirements, how do you remove a board member, things like that. Uh, bylaws, like I said, are not always or not usually recorded, but every once in a while we do run into a set of them that is recorded. And so if your bylaws are recorded, you're going to want to make sure that your amendments to your bylaws are also recorded unless you record something different called a rescission that basically says, we're unrecording this, we don't wanna to have to record everything for our bylaws going forward. Your rules and regulations and other policies like collections policies or communications policies, these are typically adopted by the board without an owner vote and they can supplement or clarify the declaration and the bylaws, but they can't contradict or overrule them. You can't put certain types of restrictions in the rules, like you can't ban smoking in your condo units or ban a certain breed of dog in the rules unless your declaration 
specifically gives the board the authority to further regulate those types of issues, not the smoking thing, but the animals thing. Um, amendments to the declaration require an owner vote and also must be recorded, just like the, the declaration uh, is. Rules and regulations do not require an owner vote and don't have to be recorded because the rules are not recorded. I will offer that if you're a Wakayawa community, although you don't have to allow your owners to vote on the rules, whenever you adopt a new rule or change existing rules, and this also applies to policies that are enforced against your owners, you have to send them out to the owners and tell them when you're gonna be voting on it as a board and allow them a, a meaningful opportunity to comment on the changes or the new rules that you're adopting before the board can then vote to adopt it. So you have to essentially give them notice and an opportunity to comment before you can adopt new rules. Um, another document that is um, relevant to almost every association but often overlooked is the Articles of Incorporation. And perhaps in the hierarchy, I should have listed this much further up um, the, the list because it does have more authority, for example, than say your rules and regulations do. For many associations, the Articles of Incorporation are essentially silent. It's like a printed document from the Secretary of State that says when you incorporated and what your, what your association name is and who your directors are and what your purpose is. But other communities have Articles of Incorporation with more substance in them. So that's another document to be aware of. Um, Ken, did you want to add anything to that sort of brief description of documents and their topics? Uh, yeah, a couple things. One is the articles do trump or override the bylaws. Typically, the articles of incorporation will simply state that other methods of dealing with the governance are to be included in the bylaws. But sometimes we run into articles of incorporation, which are very detailed and will, for example, state the number of board members. And if the articles of incorporation state the number of board members and you want to change the number, you can't do it in the bylaws. You have to go also to change the articles of corporation. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing I'd like to just add a little about is another sort of class of documents, which are policies which the board uses to be consistent in how it deals with issues. And these don't have to be distributed to all the owners the way that rules are distributed to all the owners. These might include things like your collections policies, your investment policies, how you're going to invest your reserve funds. It might have policy, you might have policies on how your architectural review will be done. You might have policies about how you would bid to get uh, multiple bids on work that you're contracting for. If you have employees, you should have employment policies, which relate to how the uh, employment relationship is handled. And so all of these policies would allow boards to be consistent in how they manage the affairs of the association as you change board members. We don't see a lot of policies in this area outside of larger associations which may have their own employees. But certainly if you're looking to try and get consistency in something, that's the way to do it. Um, I've got at least one client that has established policies for their electric vehicles. I've got clients with policies on uh, investment of reserves, uh, specifying the kinds of investments that can be done and who has the authority to you know, buy that next uh, CD or next treasury bond when uh, the one that they have matures. So it is possible to get more consistency. And you can also find a lot of policies like these on the internet, because a lot of associations without thinking it's a good idea or not, have posted policies on the internet for their communities. So it is possible to find examples of what other communities are doing which might help you in deciding whether you need a policy. Thank you, Ken. I did wanna just clarify one thing. I might've misheard you, but I, um, if you included the, the collection policy in the list of documents that doesn't have to be published to the owners, I, don't, I, I might've misheard that, but I just wanted to make it clear to those listening that if you have a collection policy that does things like um, imposes a late fee or otherwise um, notifies the owners of their their, what's going to happen when they don't pay their assessments, that does need to be published to your owners. 
I should, agree. Right. Parts of the policy, like what the late fee is, what the yeah. interest rate is, those absolutely have to be in your rules when payments are due, when late fees are assessed. But you don't have to include in the policy every one of the remedies which the association may have available to it. That's already in the declaration. Yeah. You don't have to state in your uh, policy that you publish to the owners that at exactly 90 days, you are going to turn over every collections matter to an attorney because that is a decision which needs to be made by the board at the time based on the facts and circumstances, which might include the communications you're already having with the owner, how much money is involved, whether it is regular assessments or whether it's fines and interest and late fees. There are too many factors for you to have a single policy and a single procedure you will follow every time with every collections matter. And so those are the parts which I'm saying, I'd like you to have a policy that might say that at 90 days, the board is going to make a decision. But what the decision is, is not gonna be dictated by time alone. No, agreed. And I mean, there's so many other variables that change when it is reasonable for a board to refer an account to the association attorney that a time limit alone doesn't make sense as the controlling factor. Also, I think it bears mentioning that the changes to our statutes that took effect last year for association foreclosures require a specific board vote before proceeding with any individual foreclosure action to collect unpaid assessments. And so I think that is indicative of a legislative desire that boards actually vote and make specific decisions on each of these accounts, as opposed to just having blanket policies that are applied sort of without regard to the facts and circumstances of each particular account. So and we have had managers tell us they didn't need to get a board vote because they knew how the board would vote. Yeah. Or the board had already told them that whenever it hit 90 days to just do it. And our answer has been consistently, we cannot do the collections matter for them if they are not fulfilling their obligations right. to have uh, inquiry and discussion and make a decision at the board level. Yes, agreed. Um, and just as an aside, if it would be helpful and you are curious about what a good collection policy looks like, one that we would say you should send to your owners, you can send an email to info at condolaw.net and we'll send you a copy of our sample. Keep in mind it can't be adopted or used as it is without it being customized to each particular association. But it gives you a good idea of a, what a policy should look like because it's written in plain English. So everybody who reads it is gonna understand what will happen if they don't pay their assessments. It provides clear authority for a late fee. It tells your owners what the interest charge that's required by your declaration is. And it also talks about the board's discretion. Nothing in the policy or the sample policy that we use says that it has to go to the attorney at this point or at that point. It preserves the board's discretion because of what Ken mentioned earlier about how different each um, situation is. So um, there's some follow-up questions in the chat about policies. And so I'm gonna jump to those really quickly instead of leaving them to the end. Um, one question was, are there legal requirements for something to be considered a policy? Uh, no, I mean, I think we call documents a lot of different things. I think it's clear or should be probably what the rules and regulations are. A policy is just a document that sets forth how the association is going to handle a particular set of circumstances. But it doesn't have to say the word policy on it for it to be counted as a policy. And what title you use with the document isn't the thing that dictates, for example, whether it's an internal document or whether it's published to your owners. There are also things called board resolutions that end up acting similarly to a rule or a policy. So I think the important thing is to be as clear as possible, um, as plain and simple, as clear as you can in the way you write your documents and the titles that you use with them. Certainly, if you're ever in doubt about what a document should be called or whether a particular document needs to be published to your owners, check with your association attorney. Ken, did you have any more thoughts on the, how we title these documents? If you're gonna title it a board resolution, it better have been voted on by the board reflected in the meeting minutes. Yes. 
Agreed. Okay, there's another follow up question. When previously discussing hierarchy, policies, rules, and regulations, there was a difference noted on the association regulating pets versus smoking in condos. Which topic is the one that needs to be handled differently from the other topics and why? So, the reference that I was making is that you, so the declaration is the document that is supposed to govern use of your own, the owner's property. And as an example, in a condominium, if the declaration is silent on the issue of smoking, you can't adopt a rule that bans smoking within the units. Sometimes in the declaration section on pets, it will say, uh, you know, domestic pets are allowed and the board has the authority to adopt further rules restricting the number of pets or restricting pets in the community or something like that. So if the declaration specifically calls out the board's authority to further regulate pets beyond what the declaration does, then it could be possible for a board to adopt a set of rules that says, you know, you can't have more than two dogs and two cats in a unit, or, uh, you know, we want to have a limit on the size of the dogs in the community, so you can't have dogs that are bigger than 50 pounds, um, other things like that. So those are both uses of the unit. But I've never seen a declaration that says we don't we're not making a we're not prohibiting smoking, but if the board wants to do that in the rules, it can do that. I have seen declarations where there are some loose restrictions on pets and then specific further authority is given to the board to regulate or adopt rules about pets. So I think that answers the question. Ken, did you want to chime in on that one too? Yeah, I, I think I would have said that a majority of both condo and homeowner association. Uh, declarations and covenants do have a section about animals or pets and they almost always state that they can only be kept subject to rules and regulations adopted by the board so that gives the board the legal authority to adopt reasonable rules i think you couldn't prohibit dogs based on that because it doesn't say you can prohibit dogs but you could certainly limit the number of dogs, the behavior of the dogs, require them to be on leash. I think you could probably do the size. It starts to, to depend on the community and the specific language in the declaration. Agreed. Okay, uh, I think we answered all of the follow-up questions to that, to the policy questions or the documents. So I'm gonna move on to our next question that was submitted in advance. And Chelsea is keeping track of all the questions that you guys are putting into the chat. So we will cover those at the end if we do have time. Um, here's our next question. I have an HOA, which an owner is requesting to review all communication between the association manager and the board of directors. Does the management firm have any obligation to provide access and review of all, doc sorry, of all communication between the assigned association manager and the board of directors? So, Owners have the right to review association records, and I'm using the term records like in its official capacity, as they are kept in the ordinary course of business. We generally take the position that board member emails are not a record of the association with some exceptions. And one example would be if you are making a board decision outside of a board meeting, that decision can only be made if it is unanimous and in writing. And so we often have boards that will vote on something in between board meetings and their email vote has to be unanimous. And those emails could be considered a record of the association because they're a record of the board's unanimous written decision outside of a meeting. As an aside, you should also ratify that decision and put it in the minutes at your next meeting, but we've covered that a lot here. So the obligation the association has to allow owners the right to review records, that's an association obligation. And it's up to the board to determine how best to respond when an owner issues a very broad request like this. I will offer that the board might wanna consult with the association's attorney as it makes its decision on how to respond. And how they respond could depend on a number of factors, including what is the owner's purpose in requesting the communications. A request, a request to review records can be rejected if the owner is requesting it for an improper purpose. But the fact that it's annoying or a burden to respond does not rise to the level of being an improper purpose. 
I also want to offer that how you conduct your business as an association or as a community is going to determine whether emails are considered records or not. If your board is taking all is doing all kinds of discussions and making all kinds of decisions via email routinely, that is probably going to cause all of those emails, or at least it could cause all of those emails to be considered a record of the association. No Washington court has weighed in on the question of whether board member emails are a record of the association, but other states have taken the position that every email from a board member that is about the association is an association record that owners are entitled to see. And those states have done this either because the court cases have held that way or because statutes have specifically been revised to provide for this. So if you disregard parliamentary procedure and you disregard the statutes about conducting business at board meetings, so the discussion and the actions are taken via email instead of at those meetings, you, I think, will have trouble arguing in court that those are not records of the association. So also, just because they're not records, even if they're not, doesn't mean they're not discoverable in litigation. So that's a lot of information about what's a record, is the email a record, is it not a record, it's a very like, I, I just spewed a whole bunch of like lawyerly arguments and words at you about whether those emails could be considered a record. I think the practical response to an owner who is saying, I want to review all communication between the assigned association manager and the board of directors is to try to work with the owner to narrow their request, is there something specific that they're looking for? To consult with the association attorney about whether the emails that are requested are in fact a record of the association. Also, sometimes even if you don't want to, to say, yes, it's a record of the association, there are circumstances in which it is the easier and cost-effective and reasonable course of action to just say, sure, here you can look at the emails about this contract that we signed last year, or whatever it is that the owner's asking for, just because it's easier to comply and, and to, uh, to, to show that the association isn't trying to hide something, for example. But if you're in doubt about how to proceed or how to respond, consulting with the association's attorney is definitely a good um, option to consider. Ken, did you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I do think that it is, <clears throat> it's going to be incredibly fact specific. I spent an hour and a half last night responding to a board on exactly this kind of issue where an owner's attorney had been demanding all of the records related to a a building for the previous 10 years. And so the questions really became, well, you know, how much work did they have to go to to find records? And <clears throat> the less that you follow parliamentary procedure and use your board meetings to make decisions, the more of a challenge this is going to be. And the HOA Act and the Condo Act were very poor at helping provide any guidance. Uh, Ukiowa has provided a lot more guidance on what records you need to provide. But <clears throat> I would say this does start to become something where getting some legal advice so that you are being consistent in how you respond to these kinds of questions uh, becomes important. What you don't want is for one owner to be given fairly free access to the information they want and then another owner to be denied information that they want when they start to look like uh, similarly situated owners. So. Thanks, Ken. All right, here's our next question. What is the process of making a motion, like something, something like moving to postpone a vote or requesting a roll call vote? If a vote is required on a motion, does it pass with a majority of those present or a majority of the owners? I'm gonna start by saying that a good resource to Google is Robert's Rules of Order, which is a book about parliamentary procedure and the rules related to that procedure. So I actually have a copy of the book, but I don't know if I can reach it right now. I will also offer, there's this book that was published by one of the CCAL attorneys uh, CCAL is the Co College of Community Association Lawyers, and it is a uh, part of the National Community Associations Institute. This is called Fast Track, Robert's Rules of Order, the brief and easy guide to parliamentary procedure for the modern meeting. And Jim Slaughter is one of the CCAL attorneys, who, and he's the one who wrote this. So if you need to just learn a little bit about how to conduct a meeting, uh, Google Robert's Rules of Order. You can either 
get the whole volume, which again, I can't reach, so I can't show it to you. Um, but it's about this big and it's about that thick. So it's not a real easy read. You can also just Google and read articles or blogs about Robert's Rules of Order. And you can try to see like if your community is larger, see if you can find Robert's Rules of Order for larger meetings. Or if your community is small, you could look for Robert's Rules of Order for smaller meetings. Just find information online. But I will also say that there is some statutory guidance on this. So when you're voting at a meeting, the method of voting is determined by the person presiding at the meeting. So there's statutory authority that says that is the case. So if the person presiding at the meeting can get an accurate vote without doing a roll call vote, then they don't have to do a roll call vote. And you as an owner, I don't even know if the person who submitted this question is an owner, but owners or members of the community don't get to dictate to the person presiding at the meeting how a vote has to be taken. And if you just Google your governing statute, RCW 6438 or 6490, whatever it is, and the word voting, it'll take you directly to the sections on voting for your community's statute. All of these statutes were revised last year, and I'm actually going to go ahead and just um, paste into the chat the citations or the specific sections of each of the governing statutes that we work with. They were all revised last year to update voting procedures. And in every single one of those statutes, subsection 3A says this, unit owners or their proxies who are present in person may vote by voice vote, show of hands, standing, written ballot, or any other method for determining the votes of unit owners as designated by the person presiding at the meeting. So as far as like the nuts and bolts of how you make a, a, a motion, generally once a meeting has been called to order and the board or the ownership, depending on what kind of meeting it is, has moved on to discussing association business, once a topic is discussed, someone, whether it's a board member at a board meeting or a, an association member at a, at a community-wide meeting, will make a motion and they'll just say something like, I move to approve the landscaping contract. And a second member will say something like, I second the motion. And then the person presiding at the meeting will call for a vote, whatever method they have decided is accurate for that meeting or for that purpose. All in favor, they might say something like, all in favor, show of hands. Or if you're doing it on Zoom, all in favor, a show of hands. Any opposed, please put your opposition in the chat or any opposed, raise your hands. At the chair of the meeting, the person presiding then tallies the votes and notifies the secretary that the motion has passed or, or was defeated, um, and by how many votes. Sometimes it's unanimous. So I, I'm, I'm on a couple of smaller committees, and we do almost all of our votes by just by a voice vote, and almost all of our motions pass unanimously. Um, the secretary is the one who records the motion, the second, and then the outcome of the vote. I will offer that there is a difference between a motion at a board meeting and a motion at an ownership meeting. So if we're talking about a board meeting, owners aren't allowed to make motions at those meetings. The only people that can make a motion at a board meeting are board members. The size of the meeting also matters, as I mentioned earlier, and certain decisions are within the board's authority and those types of motions, like I said, can't be made by the owners. Roll call voting in particular is a little different because it requires someone to track each of the owners present and then track how they vote on each motion. And having different percentage allocations can also complicate the process of tallying your votes. So it might be that <clears throat> something super straightforward like approving the minutes from the last meeting is a really easy vote to take. And even in a large community, you might just do that by a voice vote or a short show of hands. On the other hand, if you're trying to pass a declaration amendment, having a roll call vote in a community where there are different percentage allocations, so you can accurately track what percentage of owners have approved the thing, you know, the amendment, that's a whole different type of process. So part of the question also talked about, does it require a vote, a percentage of those present or a percentage of all of the ownership? And I'm gonna say that that depends. So different types of votes and different governing documents call for different percentages when you take an ownership vote. So you need to know things like what is your quorum requirement and what is the requirement for the thing that you're voting on, the percentage requirement. And is it a percentage of those present or is it a percentage of the ownership as a whole? There's no one, one right answer to those questions because for each scenario, it could be different. 
So some documents will say that a motion can pass if a majority of the owners present vote in favor, while others require that a percentage be calculated based on the total ownership. So I, I can answer your question sort of um, definitively for all scenarios or for all communities. What I can tell you is Robert's Rules of Order is a good um, primer or authority on parliamentary procedure in general. And it's a good resource if you're looking for, you know, looking to learn more about how to run a meeting, for example. And as to voting and the percentages that are required, that's a specific thing that you'll have to look mostly to your governing documents and your particular governing statute to determine the answer to. Ken, did you want to add anything to that? <clears throat> sure, there's some things where even if you're at an owner's meeting, the, the association members don't have the authority to, to vote on something. So, <clears throat> for example, boards adopt budgets. Owners ratify the budget. So the owners at a, a budget, budget ratification meeting, which is an association meeting, do not get to make motions to edit and change the budget. They can reject it or they can accept it but they can't make a motion to modify it because that's only within the board's authority. The other thing I get is, you know, how do you know whether or not you're gonna get an accurate vote with something like a voice vote? And for a lot of associations, I will suggest, we'll try the voice vote first. If you can't tell because you've got a lot of people voting on both sides, then you can go back to do a roll call vote for the people that are in attendance. But there's no point in wasting your time on a, um, a roll call vote for something like approving the agenda or approving the minutes of the last meeting when you don't have any contention about, you know, what it is. So we're trying to be expedient with meetings as well. Yeah. All right, here's our next question. What recourse is there for homeowners if they request financial information such as invoices, bank statements, audits, etc., and it is not provided? Property manager and board members have been reminded that by law and according to our declaration, owners are to be given access to all financial information. Our property manager uses Appfolio, which would make it easy and inexpensive. So I'm gonna just start by repeating the beginning is that we cannot give legal advice. So I can't tell you what you should do in your particular situation. All we can do is offer some general suggestions for how to handle disputes or concerns that an owner might have with their board with respect to things like financial records from a general perspective. So I'm gonna start by giving you the citations to the governing document sections that pertain to records. So for condominiums formed before Wakaiowa, it's RCW 6434-372. For HOAs, it's 6438-045. And for Wakaiowa, it's 6490-495. 6490-495. Wakaiowa also provides a list of records and how long you should hold them, which we think it's reasonable for other boards to consider using as a guide, even if Wakaiowa is not your governing statute. As to the question itself, your recourse when you're trying to get records and you feel like you can't is the same as any other dispute with your, with your board. So I want to point to a couple of things you'll need to consider. One is that the governing documents for your community might contain a, an alternative dispute resolution provision, or they might even have a section that's called something like condition precedent to legal action or prerequisites to legal action. So you need to look at your documents really specifically to see if there is a specific method that is proscribed when it comes to dealing with a dispute between an owner and the association. As with any dispute, our general preference and recommendation is for associations and owners alike to approach things as cooperatively as possible for in, in the beginning, right? Don't go from like zero to 60 in five seconds when you feel like you're not getting what you want. Try to communicate proactively, um, may perhaps start attending board meetings so you can become more aware of what the association's business um, and way of conducting business looks like. Try to negotiate with your board to see if they can give you what it is that you're asking for. Also, consider how they're responding. So did you ask for you know, 10 years of financials and just get a no? 
Are they asking you to tailor your request or narrow it to make it a little bit more easy to respond to um, and, and proceed accordingly? If direct communication, cooperation, negotiation, and those things don't work, then one thing you could consider doing is hiring an attorney that works with individual homeowners to write a letter to your board asking them to comply with the records request. You could also try submitting the, the dispute to mediation. The Washington State Community Associations Institute has a fantastic low cost mediation process or option that is much, much cheaper than any mediation process you would find on the open market, so to speak. And the benefit of going through WSCAI beyond the fact that it's cheaper is that you're dealing with mediators who are intimately familiar with the statutes that apply to community associations. Um, and as a last resort, if everything else fails, you could sue your association and take them to court. Um, litigation is extremely expensive and almost never um, the best option in, in our opinion. I think a really big part of my job, I consider it to be a really big part of my job, trying to help my clients avoid litigation whenever possible, even though I like litigating, but it's not, it doesn't benefits my client benefit my clients most of the time. So beyond sort of the basic or black and white answer to the question, which is you have the same recourse as with any other dispute, I would like to start by saying that the vast majority of the board members and managers that I have interacted with are trying to do their best for their associations. And so I, I try to operate or start from an assumption that, that everybody in the scenario, both the board and the owner and the manager are trying to act from a place of good intent. And starting from a position of cooperation and assuming the best often helps keep interaction with your board more productive and positive. So as an attorney representing community associations, what we wanna see if we have a client that ends up in a dispute after the fact with an owner over a records request, as we wanna see that an association has made reasonable efforts to respond to the request. It's easier to stand up and defend an association's actions in court if we can provide evidence that the board was trying to respond reasonably rather than being <clears throat> obstructionist. How will the conduct of the manager or the board look to a judge if you end up in a courtroom with an owner alleging that you failed to provide them access to records to which they are entitled? Those are the questions that I want my clients asking themselves as they review and respond to owner records requests. I also want to comment that an owner's right to review association records is not absolute or unlimited, and an association is only obligated to allow owners to review records in the manner in which they are kept in the ordinary course of business. It is not, an association is not obligated to distribute financials or other records to all owners. On the other hand, sometimes it is just easier to send the requested financial document, a PDF, whatever, to an owner. Not all records are subject to disclosure to the owners. Things like attorney-client privileged communications, information that's relevant to a current like ongoing competitive bidding process, or if the owner's request is for an improper purpose, if the records that you're requesting contain private information. So for example, if there's uh, some sort of bank or financial documents that contain uh, bank account numbers for, for your owners who are on automatic withdrawal, you should not be giving out or allowing owners to review other owners' bank account numbers, okay? So you have to find a way to redact the information that's private while still complying with the records request. Um, if you go to our website, condolaw.net, and you go to the resources, you'll see our, uh, Q, our sort of like FAQ book for community associations. We published our most recent book in 2019, Chapters 41 and 42 are both relevant to this question of records. What is a record? When do you have to comply with a records request? What records do you not have to disclose to your owners? So you can download the whole book in a PDF on our website and look at chapters 41 or 42. Um, I think that's all that I have on this topic. Do you want to add anything, Ken? No, I'm good. Okay. All right, our next question. What authority does a board have to use association funds, both operating and reserve, for non-budgeted and non-emergency projects instead of the budgeted and reserve study work? So the short answer is the board has very broad discretion. 
broad authority to spend association money as it sees fit within certain parameters. Um, I'll take a step back and mention that every action that a, that a board or an association takes is supposed to be reasonable. So it is uh, reasonable, for example, to shift the way you spend money from the way the budget suggested if there's an emergency that arises and you have to deal with a repair that you weren't expecting. It is probably unreasonable to decide that you're going to throw the budget out the window and spend half a million dollars on fireworks for the 4th of July or, you know, something else equally dumb like that. So reasonable is one of the touch phrases or words in our practice area that we always, it's the lens through which we view all association actions. But I think it's helpful to keep in mind that a budget is a spending plan and reality does not always follow our plans. So it is not unusual for unbudgeted expenses to come up, and that means a board has to handle those unbudgeted expenses. Similarly, a reserve study is a savings plan, but if the decks fail three years before they were scheduled to be replaced, or if an owner drives their car into the community gate, necessit necessitating its replacement or repair out of schedule, then it might be appropriate for the board to reallocate money budgeted for other things to deal with those expenses or to just spend the money now instead of in three years when the reserve study anticipated the expense. So it's really important, I think, to understand that budgets and reserve studies are tools. They're, they're ed really, really, really well-educated estimates for what type of spending you're going to have to do in a current year or when you're going to have to replace or repair certain com components within your um, property, but reality sort of messes with our best laid plans. And so the board has very broad authority to adjust accordingly. And the alternative, if boards had no authority and no discretion to deviate from the budget or from the reserve study, you would either have repairs, necessary repairs that needed to be done that were left undone, or you would have to specially assess your owners every time an unexpected expense arises. And this is not only impractical, but it would be very unpopular with most owners. <laughs> um, I do wanna comment that the board's authority is probably more limited if the project in question is a capital improvement. Many governing documents contain limitations on the board's discretion with capital improvements. Uh, including the, the possibility that you would have to get an ownership vote in order to make a capital improvement. I will also offer there is a court case that has held that a repair is not a capital improvement, so owner approval is not required for repairs, even when they're made out of schedule. And I also want to note that the term capital improvement has a different definition in our world than it does under the IRS uh, tax code. So if you're a tax person and you're familiar with the definition of capital improvement from a uh, tax perspective, you can throw that definition out the window because it's not the same as a uh, capital improvement in the condo and HOA world. Did you want to add anything to that one, Ken? No, I'm good. Okay. Next question. And this is our last one prepared in advance. So hopefully we'll have time for maybe one more from the chat. <laughs> Does the law specify how reserve funds should be replaced when they are used for projects not in the reserve study schedule? We have covered this topic several times in recent Zooms, like within the last four to six weeks. So please check out the YouTube channel, expand the description underneath the, the recent videos and watch those. But the short answer is this, if the expense that's being paid for is not a reserve expense and it's not an infrastructure expense. Then the board would need to notify owners that the money is being borrowed from the reserve fund and have a plan in place to repay the money within two years, unless that schedule Im imposes an unreasonable hardship to the owners and then you can have a longer repayment plan. If the expense is for a reserve study item or for a piece of your infrastructure that should have been included in the reserve study, but it's just out of schedule, then it, you pay for it out of the reserve fund without any further steps being taken. Again, a reserve study is the sort of the best possible estimate of when repairs and replacements are going to need to be made. But if your decks fail three years earlier than the repair was budgeted for, then you pay for the decks out of the reserve fund this year, and it's not considered borrowing because you're paying for the repair of a reserve component. I think that covers that question. And I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to that, Ken? Well, I would just add that 
<clears throat> you're supposed to update your reserve study every year. So what you contribute the following year will take into consideration any unplanned or unbudgeted expenses from your reserves. And so it is a self-correcting financial planning tool. It is not a maintenance plan. Just because the reserve study says you're gonna replace a roof in 2025 does not mean that's actually when you're gonna replace it. But if you were to follow the plan for the contributions, which will adjust every year based on your actual experience, then you should be able to avoid special assessments. Thanks, Ken. All right, um, I did notice one of the questions in the chat is a question about how the term usage is interpreted in the budget statute or the assessment statute um, section within the Condo Act. And Victor, I wanted to tell you, we actually answered this specific question three weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago. So please check the YouTube channel and look at our two or three most recent videos to get an answer to that question. Uh, we did have it submitted to us by someone else, or maybe it was by you and you just weren't there that week, but um, we, we covered it really recently. So we're not gonna cover that today. Uh, do you have a document or verbiage that relates to the COVID-19 policy or procedures that you can provide as an example? Uh, we do not, we don't have that. I think what we were talking about is just putting it on your board meeting agenda, your, you know, your standing board meeting agenda so that every month you at least briefly touch on the topic of COVID, determine whether the association needs to implement some changes in how it's dealing with COVID, if at all, and then you know, move on. So that, that's, there's no verbiage that we have as an example. And there's another comment in the chat, is, which is that if you need the Secretary of State stuff done quickly, you can pay the rush fee and you get it in two days, money talks. Teresa, has that been true even since they went to paper filing? I'm not going to put you on the spot, but if you want to put your answer into the chat, that would be great. Um, Chelsea, did, are there other questions that you think are quick enough for us to handle in like two minutes? <laughs> um, I don't know how long you guys need to cover them. Okay, um, all right. <laughs> but I also have, do management companies need to disclose to the board if they're receiving commissions or referral fees from suppliers? And oh. you mentioned having a specific vote for foreclosure on an account. Do you need a specific vote to turn over to collections? Okay, well, I can tackle that last one. Um, I, my preference is yes, that a board votes when an account is referred to council, even if it's just for that initial demand letter or lien. Um, I think a board can certainly put into place sort of internal policies and parameters that uh, suggest an account is ripe for being turned over to the association attorney. But because of all of the different variables that can change from one file to the next, I think that um, my preference is that the board vote individually to refer files. Or, or even if, let's say you're an association with annual assessments and there are 27 people that haven't paid the 2022 assessment, you can vote collectively to send those if they're all you know, in the same amount due and they've been delinquent for the same amount of time. I don't, I think my preference is not for things to be sent automatically without board awareness and involvement in that process. Ken, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I agree with that. Okay. Uh, well, it's 1059, and Cam also commented that, yes, the <clears throat> extra $50 for the expedite fee works miracles with the Secretary of State. So if you're dealing with a renewal that's been sitting in their office forever, and you don't want to take the time to call them, perhaps you could consider submitting it with the rush fee to see if that gets it through any quicker. Uh, the questions that were submitted that we did not get to today will add to next week, or you can please email them to info at condolaw.net so that we can cover them next week. Thank you for joining us and we will see you then. Bye everybody. Okay.